Hello, everyone. Welcome to Voices in Leadership During Crises. My name is John McDonough. I'm a professor of practice at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And I am in the Department of Health Policy and Management. I also direct our Center for Executive and Continuing Professional Education. Voices in Leadership focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. During the coronavirus outbreak, our regular series has been modified in two important ways. Uh, the first is that we're broadcasting using Zoom. And the second is that we're creating a very special focus on what it takes to lead in a crisis, especially during this global pandemic. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Karl Lauterbach, and we will be discussing the German response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Karl Lauterbach is a professor of health economics and clinical epidemiology at the University of Cologne. He is a leading member of the Deutsche Bundestag, which is the lower house of the German parliament. He's also a graduate and a current faculty member adjunct at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. In many ways, Karl has become the face of the German response to the COVID-19 crisis. So Carl, welcome to the program. We're really honored and pleased to have you with us today. Uh, thank you, John, for the invitation and uh, thank you for having me. So let me start just by asking you a, a, a personal question about yourself. How does one go from being a physician to an epidemiologist to running a policy research center in Germany to becoming a member of the German parliament and now playing, as you have for most of the past 20 years, a leading figure in German health policy development. How did all of that happen to you? Well, I was always interested in issues of justice and in healthcare and also uh, prevention in healthcare. And in that, uh, let's say, research venue, I was advising the German government. I was advising that time Chancellor Gerd Schröder and his Minister of Health uh, in terms of, let's say, what policies would be needed in order to make uh, the German healthcare system more efficient, to make it more equitable, and also to, be, to put more prevention into place, for example, in secondary prevention, uh, by disease management programs and to have a better competition. At that time, we had a competition that was inefficient, a kind of inefficient competition. So being an advisor, after some time, it became clear to me that I may be more influential in being in parliament myself, rather than, let's say, advising politicians. It appeared to me that I could make a bigger difference. At that time, I thought so. Uh, in being a politician myself. So a scientist politician or a politician scientist, what is it like to be in this high level of German politics and policy development with the reputation and the credentials of a scientist? Well, it's, uh, it does have advantages and it does have disadvantages. But I should say the advantages are overwhelmingly decisive. One disadvantage to start with that is that obviously, if you come to the field, you are new. Most of the, let's say, uh, party members have been in the party for decades and they have been in uh, other parts of the uh, German parliament, for example, uh, local parliaments and so forth. So you are lacking that type of experience. So I was lacking that type of experience. And I had to learn this. It's not easy. Being a politician is a skill in itself that is not to be underestimated. So I had to fast track, learn the skills of becoming a politician. I had some experience from student politics, but that is different than, let's say, playing in the upper league. The advantage is, uh, if you know for what purposes you enter politics. Obviously, you are given a unique opportunity to fight for those um, policies. And we were very lucky. I was very lucky. Uh, I've been involved in politics either as an advisor or since 2005 as a member of parliament uh, for 22 years. And in these 22 years, 
18 years, the Social Democrats have been part of the government. So it was a unique opportunity. I was privileged to basically be almost exclusively associated with the governing side in parliament and that made it possible to have a long-term perspective which I tried to take advantage of. So Chancellor Angela Merkel is with the Christian Democratic Party. Right. You're with the Social Democratic Party, but for most of the time, you've been in coalition together. And so you are in close quarters with the chancellor and, uh, and the Christian Democrats, as well as your own party. Right, that's true. And uh, our parties, the Social Democrats, are middle left, so to speak. So are we, we are not the uh, most left party in German parliament, but we are center left, you would say. And therefore, we are in a coalition with the conservatives, which are center right. So okay. Conservatives, uh, Christian Democrats are center right, and they are not far right. We are center left, and we uh, therefore have a it's a kind of a, let's say a, a, a middle coalition, so to speak. Very different situation than the United States. Let's turn to the pandemic, if we can. Um, today it's uh, June fourth, two thousand and twenty. What is the current situation today with the COVID-19 virus epidemic in Germany? Well, this, I would say that uh, currently we have, by and large, mastered the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, we currently have about, let's say, 500 cases per day, roughly speaking. And uh, we, in total, had more than 8,000 deaths which is let's say, the, the, the way too many, but fewer deaths per capita and also in total than most other European countries. So we are currently reasonably in control of the pandemic and we are actively preparing for a possible resurgence in the fall. So that is currently going on. We, we are currently focusing on two things. We want to reestablish a strong economy so we come up. We have come up with a major, uh, uh, let's say, um, stimulus plan for the economy, and we try to prepare ourselves for a possible resurgence in the fall, so that we are not hit by a second wave like in the Spanish flu in the fall to come. Mm -hmm. So the performance of Germany during the pandemic stands in sharp contrast to how things have unfolded in the United States. Uh, they also stand in sharp contrast to many of the other countries in the European Union, Spain, Britain, Sweden, Italy, other countries. What do you believe most explains how Germany has been able to deal with this crisis in a much more successful way without the damage that we've seen in so many other nations? I would think that there is, let's say, a two things. First of all, we had a fair amount of luck. And number two, we avoided uh, major mistakes. Let's start with the luck first. Our luck was actually, unfortunately, I should say, the misery in Italy and also in many other countries, but in particular in Italy. We were shocked by the video coverage and the pictures we saw from Italy early on uh, at a time when we didn't have that many cases in Germany uh, already. So we basically were a little bit behind Italy and also Spain when the big surge of cases came. So this was our luck because we were not taken by surprise. As horrible as what happened to Italy is, it helped us basically in order to understand quite clearly that this is not comparable to the flu and this is not minor, but a major catastrophe is looming here. So the public was prepared. And number two, then we avoided major mistakes. We immediately, I think that this was important, we immediately addressed the public in a bipartisan uh, way. So the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats, but also all opposition parties went out and said, well, this is a national emergency and we all stand behind the measures uh, that are proposed. This is not, let's say, politics as usual. This is not uh, the government 
against the opposition, but we have an emergency, so we have to address this as a nation. We immediately recommended massive testing, widespread massive testing from the very beginning was initiated. We had capacity available there. So from the very beginning, we were doing 50,000 tests per day. We later ramped this up to 100,000 tests a day. So massive testing was done for everyone showing symptoms. Uh, we uh, initiated uh, a lockdown, which came in three degrees. First, let's say no major uh, events being permitted anymore. Then we closed the schools and then we closed business. And we came up with a lockdown, which was fairly rigorous and which we explained to, to the population. And uh, also, which is important for those early cases, which we had in the first wave, we had a fairly well prepared healthcare system. We have the highest number of uh, ICU beds per capita in Europe. We also have the highest number of ventilators and uh, let's say a special uh, ventilatory support systems uh, per capita in Europe like ECMO treatment or ARDS treatment. So we were able to treat the patients that were severely ill in our tertiary care centers there was an immediate lockdown. There was, let's say, no disagreement about the policies between opposition and the government parties. And we made it quite clear to the pop, uh, population in addressing the population on TV, in the media, in the social uh, media, uh, stay home, uh, follow the stay home order and uh, immediately get yourself quarantined and tested if there is any symptoms whatsoever. So just um, to, to summarize uh, this point, so what are the key lessons that other health systems around the globe could draw from the German experience in particular? Which elements would you say are the most important? Pay attention to this, look at this, in terms of what led to just the dramatic difference in terms of the outcome thus far in terms of the pandemic? What, what would you say are the two, three things most important to learn from the German experience? Well, number one, transparency about what you know and what you don't know. So we were very honest and open about, let's say, our knowledge uh, about the pandemic. We were immediately uh, was, uh, let's say, responding, and we explained to the public transparently what we believe what could happen, the worst case scenario, and what we would advise everyone to follow in order to be, be sure that this come, doesn't come along. So transparency is number one. Don't mess around with the public in an emergency situation. Be open and transparent, and that, be, if possible, that, should, that message should, should be supported by the opposition as well as by the government parties. Number two, testing is very important because if you don't know who is getting sick, everyone with any symptoms whatsoever should be tested immediately so that you are able to control the disease locally. Self-quarantine and testing was important. Number three, availability of beds, hospital beds. So we made, we made space in the ICUs and uh, for ventilation support for everyone needed, so an immediate response, a national response. And number four, I would say that uh, you change the policies as you go along, but always be open about why you change the policy. So we were, uh, let's say we were, working, we were working shoulder to shoulder, politicians and scientists, and we would permit the scientists to come uh, on the stage together with the politicians and explain to the public what is currently known and what we do not know and why we change the policy. So transparency, not only at the beginning, but also while you go along and possibly have to change the strategy. How confident are you and German policymakers or not confident that we will see a resurgence of the virus coming up in the fall? Is this a consensus of opinion that we should expect this? Is there a lot of uncertainty and disagreement? How do you assess that looking forward at this point? 
Well, as a scientist, I would say it is unclear. It is very likely that there is a resurgence because we have little immunity in the population. So everything, everything speaks in favor of a resurgence in the fall. There is also a couple of things that we do not know. Uh, the virus may change, may become more infectious, may even become more risky, but may also uh, change into, the, into another direction. But from, let's say, the uh, immunity perspective, from the medical, from the epidemiological perspective, it is quite likely that in the fall, a, a second wave a resurgence will come about. In particular, since we need, know that, let's say, drier, colder climate and being indoors are major risk factors for the disease, for the infection, and also for becoming uh, more ill because of a higher infectious dose. So therefore, everything speaks in favor of a, a resurgence. It is not quite clear because we learn to manage the pandemic increasingly, in particular the, what is called super spreading, um, the super spreading quality of the pandemic is important for control. We know that a fairly small amount of those that who are infected infect many other patients while others do not infect anyone at all. This is what's called the dispersion factor, the K factor. Since the K factor is so small, it is quite possible that we are in a position to fight a second wave more effectively than we were able to fight the first wave where we didn't have that knowledge available. I think that this is very important knowledge that we currently know, that we already know that uh, uh, avoiding clusters of disease is key in avoiding a second wave. One of the sayings that I've heard that I keep in mind in these kinds of crises is uh, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Is that um, how it's done in Germany? It's not clear that's how we've been doing it in the United States, but is that something that people in whatever you call it uh, adhere to as a guidepost? Well, this is at least what we did in the first wave, and I'm in favor of doing that in the fall, let's say the fall as well. I have always been in favor of that strategy. If you explain to people that you cannot rule out the worst, but you do not, you, you basically be open about it, I do not want you to panic, but we cannot rule out that this is going to happen. Then people understand what is at issue and they are prepared to follow uh, recommendations. So we had a high compliance in Germany with what we were recommending. And this was mainly due to the fact that we explained in honest terms what we cannot rule out, but would be the worst for the population. So we were not creating panic, but we, we were open about it. This was the understood strategy by the government and uh, it has worked. I would recommend this for the second wave, a possible second wave as well. But now the strategy in the fall in Germany is more controversial because we now have, let's say, more of a, um, and we now have an opposition against what we have done, as a matter of fact. Some people believe that the success, the success that we had, we would also have had with, without these measures. I think that is mistaken, and the science doesn't show that. But in particular, for my, what I would call the far-right political wing, we see um, heavy attacks on what we have done, despite the fact that, in my opinion, it has been reasonable, successful, so we will see how we get along with that. Um, we address this as well openly. We think that this is part of the pandemic, uh, this response, but I would be in favor of this approach. Once again, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. So you must be watching, as a lot of us are in the United States, what's happening in Sweden, where they took a laissez-faire let's not give people a lot of mandates or directives, unlike the other Nordic countries. And they're seeing a death rate that is far in excess now of all of their neighboring countries. Have you drawn any conclusions from the Swedish experience that are helpful to you in terms of thinking about the German situation? 
Yes, I have followed the Swedish experience quite closely and uh, I was, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I was worried about that because they were targeting, in my opinion, herd immunity without announcing uh, this target. So it was somewhat, uh, in my opinion, not quite honest approach. It was not an open approach. It was not sure, uh, it was not clear what they were doing. What they uh, appeared to be doing is that they had minimum protection of the population and even less so for older patients. So they were not really uh, vig vigorous in, let's say, uh, uh, making ventilation, ventilatory uh, support, ventilation support available for 80 plus patients and so forth. Um, people that, were, that became, became ill in nursing homes were typically not brought into the ICU. So I didn't like the strategy and it was not well received in Germany. Is, um, f uh, COVID fatality is four times the COVID fatality we saw in Germany. It didn't help the economy because the studies clearly show if the fatality is poor, the economy is poor as well. It is almost, it is naive and wrong to think that uh, it brings you a better economy if you permit more people to die. Uh, people are not stupid. They see what is going on. So it didn't help the economy either. And it, to some degree, reminded me of a kind of an age-related rationing because it was quite clear that younger patients with the same severity of the disease uh, were treated more extensively than older people. So we clearly decided early on that we would not follow, uh, we would not follow this uh, path. We would not, we were not prepared to follow this way. I know you have um, a particular pattern in your life right now. You spend all day on politics and policy and you spend all evening, you go back home and you are up till two or three in the morning reading medical journals and trying to catch up with the science as a good epidemiologist. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of confusion about when we might expect a vaccine. Um, most of the experts are saying, listen, it's gonna be 12 to 18 months out. Uh, President Trump and other leaders and people from the industry are saying, look, this is on a real fast track. And we expect we're gonna have, a, Dr. Fauci said we may have, hundreds of thousands of vaccines ready in January. Uh, what's your honest assessment of what we should expect or think about in terms of an effective vaccine? Well, my, my background with respect to that question is I read all of the available literature and I'm also in touch with the leading virologists in Germany, obviously, almost on a daily basis. My impression is that it is, let's say, more likely that we have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months from now. I would be surprised if we managed to have that earlier. A vaccine that works, it has to be very effective and very safe at the same time. And this is a difficult combination to have if you are uh, looking at a coronavirus. Uh, and a lot of, so let's say, very appealing, very modern, uh, uh, types of vaccines that are currently tested, like uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Um, they may work, let's hope they work, but it is not that likely because uh, so far for human, uh, let's say, conditions, they have never worked, they have never been employed. And uh, I'm hard pressed to see how we can uh, put a vaccine into place for people that we have never seen working in humans for any other disease before. So I would rely on more tested routes and these routes typically with the safety you need here will take you 12 to 18 months. That's how I would look at it. And uh, therefore uh, an earlier vaccine would be welcome, but I, I, we do not, um, uh, we, we do not rely on that in Germany. We definitely do not rely on that. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a little bit, if you can, about your impressions of the reputational damage to the United States over the past six months. Uh, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one of the premier 
disease fighting organizations around the globe has really fallen short in this crisis. Uh, there are new reports of our Food and Drug Administration um, being potentially locked in political disagreements with the administration. Um, how much, in your view, reputational damage has the United States suffered in the course of this virus, if, if at all? What's your, can you share your impressions on, on that? Well, let me first express uh, that this really means a lot to me because I lived, I've lived in the U.S. for 10 years. I come to Boston, to New York all the time. I'm an adjunct uh, professor here at the School of Public Health, and uh, two of my children were actually born in the U.S., so therefore I'm very closely connected to the country, and um, therefore I regret to say uh, I hate to say that indeed uh, the, the country has suffered some loss of rep reputation, not the, not the people, not the people, but I would see, say the leadership, also the leadership in the CDC, for example, their initial test uh, failed. Uh, it was an important failure, so it was not a reliable test that uh, was a major surprise to everyone in the field because I know to what highly valuable, first world-class quality of work the CDC has always been uh, able to perform. So we were really surprised to see such a failure. We were also surprised to see that, let's say, many of the leading scientists were not visible in the public response because they initially appeared to be not engaged by, not having been engaged by the policy leaders, uh, we obviously uh, were very pleased to see uh, Tony Fauci, whom we all think very highly of, but uh, also his appearance was somewhat, uh, sometimes also worrisome as a matter of fact. It was not quite clear at any given point what, it, what his influence as a matter of fact for the current administration is. So in that sense, uh, indeed, the response, the many deaths, the, uh, let's say, uh, uncontrolled situation of the pandemic, that was a surprise to anyone in Germany, me included. And I should say that, let's say, the, the uh, policy response clearly was a disappointment from the German perspective. That does not carry any weight into the academic institutions because we currently see that many of the best academic institutions are at the forefront of producing very valuable research. This is the kind of research that I read on a nightly basis as a preprint and so forth. So we, we are clearly aware that the best university institutions and research institutions in the US are extremely valuable and are what they have always been world class. So uh, we are almost out of time. I regret this has gone by so quickly. Just a final question. Personal lessons for you. You know, you have become a major public figure in Germany over the course of this, probably the most high profile in your 20 years. Um, what, what's important? What stands out for you? What have you learned about leadership and dealing with these kinds of challenges? I have, uh, and perhaps this is for me the most important message. I have learned that it is uh, important that we uh, should have more scientists uh, in a parliamentar in parliamentary positions in parliament. I have enjoyed this. I have enjoyed that role. And I think it to some degree worked because I'm closely connected to the scientists in Germany. I'm internationally connected. So I can basically translate the newest uh, research results into, let's say, the policy ranks in my party and uh, other parts of the government but I can also explain it on the media to the public. So that has been very gratifying for myself. And I think we, we need more uh, scientists in parliament, better scientists than me, much better scientists than me. But I think that say, even for let's say major challenges ahead of us, in particular the climate challenge, we will not be able to master the climate challenge without having more scientists that have a clear agenda in politics, either in parliaments or in the administration. I think that this is at least 
my most important uh, uh, message in particular for the students that may follow us today or the young leaders or not so young leaders who contemplate what they could take away from the horrible pandemic enter political life because scientists are badly needed in political life in my opinion in germany and in europe and possibly even in the us carl thank you for sharing your thoughts and your time with our audience today we look forward to welcoming you back to harvard when you're able to and uh, to everyone watching we'll be bringing you more voices in leadership during crisis segments in the weeks ahead Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us today. And again, special thanks to Dr. Carl Lagerbach. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.